Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, sixth annual JPL No Tow Trucks Beyond Mars at Comic Con 2020. Uh, this is the uh, uh, panel uh, where we pretend that we're uh, uh, at Comic Con in room 32AB at two o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, where we have a whole bunch of uh, people from JPL talk about uh, things that we do at uh, JPL. Uh, and this is our way of saying thank you uh, to everybody at, uh, the, uh, at, at Comic-Con. Uh, we've done some amazing things uh, and done some amazing discoveries uh, at JPL. And it's our way of saying thank you to the taxpayers, uh, basically for letting us be nerds. Um, and basically do things uh, that nobody else in the world has have done before. We couldn't have done it without your support. Uh, obviously by congressional funding and by all your enthusiasm. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, we want to tell you exciting things that happened uh, that just don't, you know, that you don't hear about uh, uh, too often. Um, we want to have fun. Uh, so please don't expect any uh, finger pointing or, or dirty laundry. Um, and we are bound by international traffic and arms regulations. Uh, so if I interrupt the, the crew, it's not because there's a conspiracy. Uh, it's because there's certain things we just can't talk about because we can't talk about it. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, we're not going to be able to answer any of your questions. Um, uh, so we'll just have to, uh, you know, uh, play it by ear. Uh, but I do want to tell the crew to please have fun. Uh, who are these people? Okay, I've been at uh, JPL for uh, 42 years. Uh, done a lot of stuff, send stuff to... Uh, uh, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, uh, uh, sent some stuff on the shuttle, uh, done an all-sky survey in the infrared, uh, basically done optomechanical uh, work and um, uh, just, just a lot of stuff. It's been an, an amazing uh, career uh, that, that I've had uh, in the last uh, Four decades, it's amazing. Uh, and I made friends with uh, a lot of people, including uh, Shante, who's been at uh, JPL for 28 years. Uh, she's been doing uh, thermal engineering and system engineering, um, uh, currently working on uh, 2020, and we'll hear a lot about that. Rhonda uh, basically is our op space optical uh, scientist. Uh, we're gonna work uh, to hear all kinds of great stories about the, the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory. Laura, I've known for a few years, uh, does uh, doing amazing science work on um, on Mars Odyssey and other extraterrestrial uh, stuff. And Kobe, uh, which I have known for many, many years, uh, working on all kinds of uh, great mechanical engineering uh, as, as a section manager, group supervisor, and other kinds of unmentionables. Okay, on that note, I'm going to let um, Shante take over. And I'm going to go to her presentation. Hold on a second. And there you are. All so, right. Shante, all right. you're on. Great. It's so great to be able to reach out to all of you today. Um, you know, I really want to talk to you a little bit about integration and test and how we use those two areas to buy down risk. You know, you often hear these great stories of miraculous saves and all of these really cool Apollo 13 moments. But I want to talk about how you prevent yourself from having those moments. So, Dave, you can give the next chart. All right. Well, since we last talked, several things have happened. What do we have next chart? Next chart. Yes. So, since we last spoke, the rover got a launch vehicle logo. This launch vehicle logo will be on the side of the rocket. Next chart. And the rover got a name, Perseverance. This name was offered by Alex Mather, a student in Burke, Virginia. He had an outstanding essay that got a bunch of us all teary, and it was just fantastic. And NASA accepted the name Perseverance. I don't think Alexander realized how important uh, that name would be and just that it is actually the mantra that we are, we are operating with right now in this very difficult pandemic time. Let's start, Dave. All right. So work on the flight software testbed is continuing. Next chart. Work on the hexabed, hexapod testbed, which incorporates that flight software testbed and the mast and the arm. That work is continuing as well. Next chart. 
And we've since begun work with the vehicle system test bed. And you can see that um, the actual more rover-like looking test bed in the garage there. And something else that we did with our test beds, we actually had a test bed certification. We had an opportunity to look at all the test bed venues and to determine whether or not we were very comfortable with the capabilities of those test beds. We did that before we started work on the test beds, but we had an opportunity to do that again. It was great to uh, revisit the differences between the test bed units and the flight units. It was great to reevaluate the extent to which we can inject faults into the system so that we can characterize performance. And we wanted to just get an overall understanding of the extent to which people working mission operations tend to rely upon that test bed to simulate problems. So, you know, it's, it's been just a tremendous experience working with those test beds, and they will certainly lend themselves well to the mission operations work. Next chart. Hey, Shante, question though, before we go up to the next one, uh, first of all, I'm assuming that there's no uh, a park bench on, on Mars, but is that a uh, drive-in movie uh, solely for the rover? Well, you know, days are long. Sometimes you, you really need a movie, and sometimes you just- Sometimes the rover needs a movie. Yeah, I was gonna say, it looks like a, like a perfect uh, drive-in. Cool. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> what happens in the rover yard stays in the rover yard. All right. So on February 11th, the rover was loaded onto a C-17 at March Air Reserve Base in Riverside, and it arrived on February 12th in the landing facility area at Kennedy Space Center. And so what you see there uh, in the lower left is the unloading of the rover. Next chart. All right, so this is real interesting here. This is a picture of our mission science team preparing for surface operations. They're sitting in a JPL conference room in early March. And, you know, of course, with the conference room, what you notice is everybody's sitting there all together. You've got, uh, you've got a display of, of what's of the coordinates and the different, um, different science-related matters that they're studying. You see a whiteboard and you see this opportunity for people to interact face-to-face, -face, for people not only to see each other's face, but to read each other's body language and to just literally work together. Next chart. What you see now is March 20th, when the mission science team continued preparing for surface operations at home. And you know, you've got your screens at home, you've got your headset, you've got an ability to use WebEx, you've got all these great things, these great tools, but it still does not replace being in the same room and just getting that work done and looking across the table to see the eye roll that you know, you're not seeing from your living room. So those types of things you just don't get, but everyone's doing the best they can. JPL has been awesome about letting everyone take everything in their office home to allow them to be as productive as possible. And you know, this is one of those situations in which in which the show must go on. We have most of the Mars team working from home. And we do have some people that are doing a little combination of working from home and going into lab. We have people that are supporting operational readiness tests that have to be in that, in that room. You know, the room where you see everybody jumping up and down, we landed, oh, we got orbit insertion, oh, you know, we took off, it's awesome, the launch was great, in that room. So we have those people that are socially distanced, wearing masks, following the safe at work protocols, but in that room because the tools they need are in that room. We have people that are still supporting test activities. They have to go into lab for those things, but by and large, everyone is at home. We're doing the best we can. And, um, you know, JPL has been great about kids running around in the background, photo bombing your, your WebEx, which my daughter is very good at. And, you know, dogs barking, trash, trucks going by and so everyone's just really going with the flow and just accepting that life is marching on that you're sharing internet bandwidth with your families and so it, it's been it's been a struggle but uh, people are marching on next chart all right now there were some other installations once the rover arrived at the cape a plate was installed on the rover chassis it was in rec it's in recognition of the covid 19 impact that we kind of just discussed there and in, in tribute to the perseverance of the healthcare workers around the world. Next chart. All right, another plate was installed. This was on the aft crossbeam of the rover. 
there are three small chips that are carrying nearly 11 million names that were submitted during the NASA's Send Your Name to Mars campaign, and the essays of the 155 finalists are all captured on those three chips. Next chart. All right. Now here's another thing that was really interesting. This is a perfect example of the impact of COVID-19. Now, under nominal circumstances, you would want the subject matter expert or the cognizant engineer or systems engineer that's really familiar with all the interfaces or someone from the mechanical area that really understands all the close clearances and such to come out to the Cape and to just be involved in what we call the walk down. When we have a walk down, you have people that are walking, they're looking at every little part of the rover. They're looking to see if there's a little crease in a blanket in which there is an opening, if there's a sight line. They're looking to see if there are any cables that have become, un, <clears throat> you know, that are no longer tied down. They're looking to see if there might be a cable that is going to rub against another component and cause an issue with deployment. They're looking for all those sorts of things. They're looking for, you know, Dacron net uh, or Dacron lacing that may have uh, come loose or it's actually more so nylon type lacing that may have come loose. They're looking for all those little things. And sometimes, you know, you, you know, you just really get lucky in catching, you know, a lot of that type of stuff with, with other means. But, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing like having that set of eyes walking around doing that work. But in this instance, we had to rely on smartphones. And so we use the smartphones on tripods and just literally turning those around and giving the subject matter expert and the coggies an opportunity to take a look and see if they see anything. Uh, I will say the technicians are fantastic. They're really knowledgeable of, of the rover. And so, you know, this is that added set of eyes that we like to have. And, you know, you know, you don't often find those extra things because so much work is done, but sometimes you do. And so that's why we go through this particular effort. Next chart. All right. So something that's interesting to note is that the sample caching system wasn't complete at the time of shipping out to the Cape. There were some components that didn't arrive until May and were installed late, mid to late May. And so what you see there are the, the actual bits that will capture those samples that will be returned to Earth at a later time. And those things have to be super clean. There was so much work. The sample caching system, that, that thing is a beast. Oh my gosh, it is so complicated. So it is no surprise that there were aspects of it that arrived later. And so that's just one example of some components that arrived later. There were other instrument components that arrived later, but that's the beauty of being knowledgeable about your, and mindful in your integration process understanding that test schedule, understanding that you have to leave those points in your storyboard for allowing, uh, basically allowing for this late arrival of hardware to still be integrated without causing any issue. Because if you look at the rover, the rover is actually nearly stacked. You know, the heat shield isn't on, but everything else is there and they're working under it to now put in this last uh, piece of equipment. You may also notice that there are people wearing goggles and you may see someone in the distance who's not wearing goggles. When you start getting really, really close to the planetary protection, especially, especially sensitive type items, like things that we're returning to Earth, you wanna be especially careful. So you have that added layer of protection. You don't want a situation in which Doug's eyelash comes back and one of the sample holders like, we found life, and it's like Doug's eyelash. That would really suck. So we try and avoid that type of thing. All right, next chart. All right. So actually, this is a little dated in that the rover was stacked and is ready for encapsulation. It's actually in that process of encapsulation right now. So that's really cool. It's actually getting the, other, the fairing around it, which is great. And uh, today, I just saw a video of uh, what they call the, uh, the wet dress rehearsal. Your spacecraft is considered wet when it's fueled. And so they're doing the dry run <clears throat> of how they're actually going to install the multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator. So everything is practice, practice, practice. You don't want to do it for the first time with the real thing. That could go really bad. And so you can't see it on the, in this particular view, but there's a hatch. And what they do is they stack everything up, they're all ready to go, and then they open the hatch and they install the, the um, multi-mission 
radioisotope thermoelectric generator. They also um, charge up the, the uh, heat rejection system with Freon. And that, that, that charging is for the heat rejection system that's on the crew stage. The heat rejection system and the rover is already charged up and ready to go. The hydrazine that supports the attitude control system, that was handled, um, that was handled some time back in the payload hazardous servicing facility at, at KSC. So next chart. All right, so, you know, basically in closing, you know, pandemic or no pandemic, we're going to Mars. <clears throat> this is gonna happen. And we have a lot of people at home, you know, we've got kids on the lap, we've got everything happening, we've got dogs everywhere. You're not, you're not gonna get through a meeting without hearing someone's computer ping some, as you probably heard, <laughs> some dog bark, you're just not gonna get through a meeting. And we got kids waving, but we're, we're really committed to getting this done and everybody's keeping really good spirits about it, you know, and people are being mindful of the need to safe distance and they're staying at home. You know, even people that can come on labs, the extent to which they can stay at home, they are certainly staying at home. So like in that picture, you've got the, the chief engineer, you've got the entry, descent, and landing, lead, you've got the project manager, you've got the most important person in the right-hand corner, <laughs> Monica Hopper, who's our, our project administrative assistant. She's probably the most person, most important person on the program because she actually does all the work that keeps all of it going. So uh, just this is just a, a representation of the number of people that are still working real hard on this mission and will continue to do so. All right. All right. I'll pass it to you, Dave. All right. Uh, Rhonda, are you up? There we go. Hi, so I'm Rhonda, and uh, this is me uh, when I was seven years old, uh, dressing like Princess Leia for Halloween. So I have had a love of the stars and a love of planets for a very long time. Uh, and I'm excited that what I get to work on now are exoplanets. So those are planets around other stars. They're outside of our solar system. I mean, Mars is great. I love Mars. But and what we want to find out what other Earths and Mars and Jupiters might be around other stars. And so we have this uh, scoreboard. It's a mirror scoreboard, so it's a little hard to see in this photo. And this is next to the elevator that the JPL director takes to his office every morning. And uh, it is showing that we know of 26 exo-Earths in the habitable zone. Uh, now, actually, that's because this is an old photo back to when I could still get on lab. And it's up now, I think we're up to 32. And there are more than 4,200 exoplanets that have been confirmed. So those are outside the habitable zone. The habitable zone is this nice zone where it's warm enough that you could have water and it'll be water. If it weren't any hotter, it would be steam. And so it'd be really hard to have life where there's only steam and no liquid water. And then there's, uh, or it could be frozen. And it's also hard to have life where it's only frozen. So this habitable zone is this nice region where we can have liquid water and maybe life. There are some other uh, really interesting things that we would look for. What you're seeing here uh, on the left is the pale blue dot picture that was taken by um, at, at Carl Sagan's recommendation by Voyager, looking back uh, at the Earth through the rings of Saturn. And that's what Saturn looks like from Earth, is that little dot. Now, if we had had a spectrometer on it, and a spectrometer just takes the light and it breaks it up into a rainbow, and then you see what's light and what's dark. And that's characteristic of uh, molecules. So the things that would be really exciting that we would be looking for is uh, carbon dioxide, because that would tell you that there's an atmosphere, right? Mars has a lot of carbon dioxide, Venus has a lot of carbon dioxide, and so does the Earth. So that would let us know, hey, maybe there's an atmosphere. It's not like the moon, it's not like Mercury, it has an atmosphere, and that's interesting. Um, and then we would also, of course, be looking for water, because we think that there has to be liquid water uh, for, the, for life to form. Uh, and then we would also be looking for oxygen. Oxygen is really exciting, because here on Earth, oxygen is made through photosynthesis. So that could be a smoking gun for life. Now, there's this whole field called astrobiology, which are chemists and biology people and astrophysicists that meld their fields together to try and do a lot of modeling to figure out if a 
planet is forming and it's in a non-equilibrium situation, can you actually have a lot of oxygen that's being made through uh, geochemical processes? And the answer is sometimes and maybe. So if we find oxygen, there are other things that we also need to find out about the planet to be able to say we think that's being made by life. That's um, where we would like to get to. Um, next, oh, I'm, I'm driving slides. You're driving, go. yeah. Next slide. Now, I'm driving. So the, um, it's lovely, it's, we wanna do it. We wanna see if there's Earth 2.0 somewhere out there. Um, now it's kind of hard, right? It is um, harder than um, trying to see a firefly next to a searchlight if that searchlight and firefly were in New York from here. In fact, it's um, 10,000 times harder than seeing that, right? So if you wanted to see that firefly, you would have to block out the searchlight. And that's really what a lot of this um, direct imaging of exoplanets comes down to. How do you suppress uh, the starlight? Well, um, let me bring a little bit closer to home, right? So we've had a number of good eclipses in the last uh, few years. I hope that some of you had a chance to see them. Um, I went to Wyoming to see the last full eclipse and Shante is shaking her head. I'm gonna ask any of the panelists, how many of you have seen a full eclipse? Laura has, right on. I have okay. not. I, I've only, I was up at uh, Redding, uh, California when, uh, uh, when we had the, the, the full eclipse and I only saw a partial version of it. Yeah, um, I totally recommend it, by the way. It is, it is totally cool. I had not seen one until the last one and, um, and I'm sold. Like I'm gonna make a big effort to try and see them in the future. But so one of the things that was cool about it is that um, there were a couple of planets um, that were in the sky. Um, there was Jupiter and Mars. Now this photo is not from the most recent eclipse. This photo is from like a 2005 eclipse and I didn't take this photo. But the important thing is that what you can see is that here the moon is what's blocking out the sun and it lets you see Jupiter and Mercury. Now, normally during the day, if there are planets up in the sky, we just can't see them because the sun is so bright. It just washes out the planets. But here with an eclipse, where you're blocking out the sun, then you can see these planets. So that's what we need to do, but we do it artificially, right? We can do it with technology. We create an artificial eclipse. Um, and that is one of the things that we have um, designed a mission concept for called the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory. Uh, and it is a mission concept for a potential future flagship mission that we submitted into the Astrophysics Decadal Review, which is going on right now. So it was one of four concepts that were submitted. And the idea is that it could launch in 2035. And it has two ways to look at uh, to how to create an eclipse. One of them is the one that you're seeing right now. It's this big, obvious, uh, it's right here on my background. This is called a star shade. It's like a big sun shade, you know, when you're driving along, you pull down the shade so it blocks out the sun. That's what this is doing, but it's blocking out other stars. And then it has to fly around uh, the, the sky. When you want to point the telescope at another star, a lot of times you're like, hey, I've got a telescope in space. I'm just going to change where I'm pointing it. Well, if you've got the star shade, now the star shade has to turn on its engine and go and it takes a couple of weeks, you know, to get to the next star that you want to see. And now I'm going to play a video of what it would look like for the star shade to deploy. Rhonda, you got to tell them how big the star shade so we is. Could launch them. Oh yeah. So the star shade is 52 meters in diameter. That means that it's the size of half a football field. Minor detail. Yeah, so you can't launch it and, and rock it in one big piece, right? You have to make it deploy like that. Um, so it, it spins apart and then, uh, and then it goes far away. It goes uh, 76,000 kilometers uh, away from uh, the telescope. Uh, and then it would block out the starlight so that you could see potential planets that might be around the host star. We're gonna play that one more time. So first of all, the petals, they, un they unfurl and they're spring loaded so that they just come up. And then the center disc has kind of this origami and, uh, and it spreads out and now it's fully deployed. And then you turn the dark side toward the telescope. The shape of those petals are really important for making uh, the shape of the shadow 
really deep uh, because we've got a factor of 10 to the 10 between an Earth 2.0 around a Sun 2.0, right? And um, so that means that when it deploys, the tips of those petals have to be in the right position to within the size of your thumbnail. So it's within that big. We have to deploy this thing that's as big as half a football field. And that's what, to keep diffraction from uh, obliterating or interfering with the, uh, the imaging of the, um, uh, of the actual planet? It, it is to control the diffraction. That's yeah. right, um, precisely enough. Uh, so, of course, we don't do it the first time on the one that's going to space, right? We work on it in the lab to try and get it to be that precise. So what you're seeing here are some deployment tests. Uh, the one on the left was happening at JPL. I'm going to play that again. And so that's, that inner disk is uh, a quarter of the size of the one that I showed you uh, in the video that we planned. And uh, all these guys are not touching it, but you can see it's suspended from the roof. Uh, with all of these uh, supports to try and do the gravity offload. And, uh, and then they measure it with a laser to see how precise it is. And they've already gotten results that show that it can deploy precisely enough. And then this one on the right, the center disk, um, it looks like a piece of origami when it unfolds, because it is. In fact, we had an intern who was really great at origami. And he said, let me take a, a try at, at trying to figure out how to fold, how to make a circle turn into a, a cylinder. Uh, and he's the one that figured out uh, how to do this. Um, the real uh, Starshade will also have solar panels attached to this inner disk. Um, so that is what I have here on uh, Starshades. There are other complicated things and difficult technologies uh, that we have to do for HabEx, like we have a way for creating the artificial eclipse inside the telescope. So it's where the light comes to a focus and it's really small, then we put like a microscope slide with a little tiny uh, circle, a specially shaped circle that we actually make with the same technology that you make uh, computer chips. Uh, and that's a way that we can create an eclipse inside the telescope. We work both of these in hybrid so that we get the complementary strengths of each one. And it's designed a mission that would give us an opportunity to get a spectra to see the rainbow from an Earth, uh, a potential Earth-like planet in a habitable zone uh, in our neighborhood of the nearest uh, 30 light years. And if it gets prioritized or selected, um, then I'm hoping that I get to work on it and it would launch in 2035. So still a ways away. Awesome. Boom. Awesome. Here we go. All right. Excellent. So my name is Kobe Boykins. Uh, so you can see the boldly going sort of stay with that idea. This is a picture of me in the high bay. Um, uh, Shante did a fantastic job talking about uh, the next rover, Perseverance. This one in the background here is Curiosity. Um, I didn't actually go into the high bay for Perseverance, but uh, you can see that I've been working on rovers uh, for quite a long time and uh, doing some various other sundry things I'm moving off into management as well at JPL. Uh, so hopefully you won't hear my kids going crazy in the background, but it's it's what it is now with the pandemic and people being at home. Okay, next slide. I guess, so one of the things for me, uh, it's funny that we were just talking about looking at stars uh, around other uh, planets, around other stars. One of the things I did when I was a kid, I grew up in Nebraska, so I get to see the night sky. And one of the beautiful things about the night sky from this particular image, which is called Hubble's uh, Deep Wide Field or Ultra Deep Wide Field, uh, every speck of light that you see is another galaxy, another cluster of billions of stars. And every time I get a chance to look at the night sky, uh, just, you know, it brings back those childhood dreams of being able to go and travel there. And, and um, I, I just think it's amazing that uh, we as a society get to play in this type of venue. Uh, um, you know, we were just, Rhonda was just talking about Starshade and what could happen with HabX and, um, you know, with JWST, the next uh, generation space telescope, and then the one after that, W first, and then maybe onto that with HabX. I mean, we're going to start to see even more of these celestial neighbors and unbelievable uh, types of imagery. I just, I, to me, I'm not even, uh, not even in that field. I just think it's really cool to see the cool images. Okay. We can show it as a video, but let's not in time. Let's just go skip past the next one and we'll go, we'll go two slides forward. 
Okay. One more. Okay. So here's JPL. Uh, earlier on, I had this in the background. I, I changed to the, the newest thing, which is Europa behind me. Um, but uh, so this is JPL and, and you can see where we all work. I, I just like to put it in there because it's, it's fun to talk about uh, this facility of approximately, oh, I guess now we're around 7,000 people, uh, including full times and contractors. And then in the summers, right, right now we swell a little bit uh, with kids coming in, uh, with students coming in to do their research, as you heard. Uh, one of the people that worked on the origami on Starshade was a student that had come to us. Uh, we actually hired him and his brother and his buddy uh, to, to come to JPL and work on it. They're both doing uh, amazing things uh, at JPL. Um, it was fun because I, I got to hire them. <laughs> so I was on the other side of that. Okay, so next, next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little thing out, outside of uh, some of the stuff that we did, some of the testing. Shanti's talked about the testing of the rover. I'll talk about some of the testing that happens before. This is one of the test setups that I did as a student. Uh, so I came to JPL as a student as well. And uh, when I was a student, uh, one of the things they asked me to do is build a test stand for the airbags. So this is going back all the way to the Pathfinder mission. Uh, Dave probably knows that one pretty well. Uh, and uh, this was where we did the airbag test. This is in Plumbrook, Ohio. It's a 150 foot diameter uh, vacuum chamber. So it was actually built for some strange reason. They, drew, they wanted to test the, the early rockets for um, uh, Saturn. Saturn V. So they would actually drive a train cart in here and then they would pull a vacuum on it to make sure it stayed pressurized. Either way, we used this whole facility. We took the airbag system up to the, the ceiling, uh, accelerated to about 80 miles per hour, bounced it off some rocks and made sure that the airbags didn't puncture it. So that was my first job as a student, quite fun. The only requirement was the rocks couldn't fall off and kill human beings. Now, no humans are in there. Uh, I guess I can tell one fun story. Um, uh, I guess, yeah, you go ahead and play it, Dave. I might, it actually might play. But uh, as it's going, oh, this is the whole entry thing. Dad, don't worry, do that. Um, we can go on to the next slide, but I'll tell one fun story about it. What we were, uh, these airbags are actually filled uh, with, with gas that comes from a gas generator uh, as, we, as we bounce around on the surface. And um, after they, they hit the ground, everybody wants to rush in. You know, you open the door, you know, bring up the vacuum, and then you check and say, so it's not a thermal chamber, so we can open the door pretty quickly. But um, one of the things is as we were coming back up to pressure, some of the engineers went in to look at the airbags and uh, one of the airbags had a rip in it and, and um, they, uh, they stuck their head inside uh, the rip and then fainted. Uh, and it was uh, really scary because we had to pull them out very, very quickly or they would not have made it. So um, even us nerdy engineers do stupid things from time to time, mostly when it's fun stuff that happens when we break our hardware. And so breaking the hardware is always a fun thing. You'll see the airbags inflate here, uh, but that was what we were testing uh, in this particular one. Uh, that goes back a ways, but it was sort of fun. There was a lot of interesting things that happened. Uh, one of the tests out in the desert, uh, we came off the rail and it bounced for about a mile down range as we chased it in a, in a Humvee. Uh, I guess it was a Range Rover. Either way, we were chasing this big, huge airbag thing as it was bouncing around in the Arizona desert. That, that was that was fun too. Not not near anybody, but you know these fun things that happened. I guess I could tell one other story. We did another uh, test of this pretty particular landing system, and we did that in Ohio, and we dropped it from a helicopter. So just the last, you know, 200-ish meters, uh, we were testing the flight dynamics of the multi-body system, and um, that that one went right for interstate. Uh, so we had to go out there and, and stop the traffic for a couple of hours as we made sure nobody got hit. That was sort of a scary one. All right, let's go to the next slide, Dave. Okay. Um, uh, no, keep going. <laughs> it's going to show this again. Oh, yeah, so some other fun things that we get to do. I think I talked about this uh, before, but I, I'll bring it up again, is that we, we're not always working in outer space. Sometimes we're working in inner space, and, and sometimes we're doing some really interesting things here on Earth. And, and this was uh, a, a mission that I got to work on uh, which we built an underwater observer, uh, what we called the subsurface uh, explorer. Uh, and, uh, and what was it? I mean, it was a big camera that we sent down uh, to the bottom of the Antarctic glacier ice sheet, but we needed to test it before we went down to Antarctica. So uh, we went up to Crater Lake, and this is in Oregon. And, um, and underneath the lake here, there's some femorals. So you can actually uh, put your instrument down there and take some images of the underwater femorals, which are these smokers where there's these biomes that uh, create because there's heat that's generated by the volcanic uh, activity underneath the ocean. And then the picture in the lower right is the old man in the lake. It's a, a tree that fell in and it just bobs around. So they put a GPS and they see where it goes around the lake, see what the currents are and where the wind is. But the lake really does look like flat in the mornings. It's, it's beautiful. We were one of the few people that actually got to take a boat out on the lake. Usually there's no... Um, boats or anything, but the USGS was doing a survey and we needed to use the boat as well to do some of our investigation. If you go to the next slide, um, you'll see this is our, our camera that went down there. 
uh, we were actually testing it. This is only about 500 meters. We needed to go down to a little bit more than 1,200 meters uh, to get underneath the glacier ice sheet. Uh, but we were doing some testing. You can see how clear the water is. Uh, it doesn't look like it in that particular image. We're already about three feet under the water. Uh, at that point, and you can see this all the way down until the light really goes away. So somewhere about uh, 10 to 15 meters uh, where it's just not reflecting the light. The light's really getting damped out by the water. Uh, next slide. And then here's uh, down in the upper left, upper left image is uh, the underwater femoralls there in, in, uh, in, in Crater Lake. And then you can see a femoral picture from underneath the ocean. And then uh, you can see Dr. Alberto Bihar, who uh, is not with us anymore. He passed in a plane crash, but he's down there on the Antarctic ice sheet uh, deploying this thing underneath the ice. And then you can see an image uh, of the, um, as we're going through the ice. And we, we saw this beautiful sort of milky ice that you see here go to this crystal clear ice uh, that you could see for, you know, hundreds of meters. And then as we got underneath the ice sheet down in Antarctic, we actually saw some worms swimming underneath uh, in, the, in the river that sort of flows underneath the ice sheet down uh, in Antarctic and goes around a mountain. Anyway, next, next slide. So I think yeah. that was it for me, but yeah, well, look at that quick. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's great. Thank you. Well, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, I worked on uh, the Lambda Point experiment, which was a, uh, an experiment flown on the shuttle. And uh, I actually had the, uh, the authority to stop a shuttle launch. Uh, I was monitoring my experiment. I was in the blockhouse. And I was told that if need be, I could, I could stop a shuttle launch, which is great. Wow. Uh, the bad news was, was that they said that if you stop the shuttle launch, you got to go over to the pad and fix it. Okay, now, believe it or not, there are, I don't know, a bazillion ways to die on a shuttle launch pad. You could fall off the platform, you could got hypergolics, you've got GN2 atmospheres, uh, you know, and they, were, they, were, they told us that, you know, one breath of, of pure nitrogen can kill you. you I'm Laura Kerber, and I'm a research scientist at JPL, and I study mostly volcanoes on other planets, but I also have been recently... I'm on a mission in operation, which is Mars Odyssey, taking pictures of Mars, which you can see behind me. And then I've been in mission formulation, so we spend a lot of time thinking about what future missions might be, could possibly exist. Um, next. And so today I'm going to talk to you about my mission Moondiver, um, which I say is a mission that does not and may not ever exist. And that's the way it is in formulation. Um, you kind of do your best. And um, when I started Moondiver, I thought, okay, my, my goal here isn't actually to have a mission that flies into space necessarily, but my goal is that everyone always says that perseverance is the thing that you need more than anything else in order to um, be a success. And so I thought, okay, I'm just going to have a, a controlled experiment to see how far perseverance alone <laughs> can get me <laughs> in the mission formulation process. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about this mission, and then if you've been following along the last couple of years, I'll tell you kind of the update of where, where we are right now. Uh, so next slide. Um, so the story begins in 2009 when the Japanese spacecraft um, Kaguya found several enormous holes in the moon. And the largest hole that they found was in Tranquilitatis. You might recognize Tranquilitatis from the Sea of Tranquility is where Apollo 11 landed. And actually, Apollo 17 was at the top of the Sea of Tranquility. And you can see this. If you look at the moon, you can see this shape. It looks kind of like a bottom of a figure eight. And um, I think starting June 27th, you'll be able to look up at the moon and see this um, as it comes into the light, as the moon waxes. And so there's the Tranquilitatis bit. If you go to the next slide. This is what it looks like up close. These images were taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera. And um, it's kind of hard. Uh, so you kind of see in the, in the side of that pit there, we have like a mysterious dark hole, and we have no idea what's underneath. And then in the side of the pit are these incredible layers. And as a geologist, I'm just ecstatic because most of the moon is covered in dust. And suddenly I see an enormous stack of lava layers that's hundreds of feet thick. And um, what we're interested in for this particular application is that the moon is covered in dust. We don't get a look at rocks very often, but the moon is also home to some of the most extreme volcanic eruptions in the solar system. And the ones that are the closest to these kinds of eruptions on Earth cause massive extinctions that each time they happen, they kill an enormous number, you know, up to six, 96% of all life in the oceans, for example, during one of these events. And so when we look at the planets, we see these same kind of volcanic eruptions only more extreme. And so we finally have a chance to look through the moon's dust and see these very extreme eruptions 
in cross section and to figure out how extreme they actually are. And so if we if we look at all the other planets which have similar kinds of volcanic um, eruptions on those, we can say what is the effect of these extremely violent eruptions on the evolution of the planets and the evolution of potentially life on those planets. Um, so the next slide. So to get an idea of how large this pit is, which is kind of difficult sometimes, um, in the picture there you can see a pit in Hawaii, and this pit is actually half the size of the pit that we're talking about, Mare Tranquilitatis. And if you look really closely, you can see a tiny person in yellow on the far side of the pit. Um, that's my friend, Anna Zina, and she's sitting there. <laughs> yeah, so you can see that's how small a person is. And then over to the side, I have um, a couple different rockets. Um, this pit, if you put the entire SLS the new NASA's new enormous rocket or the Saturn V inside this pit, it would spit with room to spare. So you could launch it out of this hole like a missile silo. <laughs> and I put the Big Ben in there also for a reference. And so, and then the wideness of the pits, it's 100 meters wide. And if you compare that to a baseball stadium, you can see you're sitting in the stands, the entire baseball stadium, uh, the field would be in the hole. Um, next. Um, so the idea behind the mission is this. Um, you land close to one of these pits with a precision landing, and then you repel off of your lander with a rover with two wheels, and it's a repelling rover, so it has a cord that it's attached to, and then it repels down across all the layers. We learn about the volcanic history of the moon as we've never learned before, and then we go into the depths of the moon, and we see how large is this underground cavern, because we know that the cavern that underlies this pit goes at least 20 meters back in a couple different directions, but we it could go kilometers back. There could be a lava tube down there. And um, so people are very interested in that because it would be a nice place to actually go and have a base because it's sheltered from all of the bad environments at the surface of the moon. Um, next. And so in order to do a mission, you know, um, Rhonda was talking earlier about sort of the um, the technology of the star shade, and then you, you combine that with whatever scientific question you want to solve. So we're interested in getting access to these layers. And the way the Moondiver began is that I was talking to my friend Issa Nesnes, who works at JPL, and he had this repelling rover that you see called the Axel rover. And I said, you know what I would do with your rover? I would send it in one of those pits that they'd recently found on the moon, and wouldn't that be cool? And so from this conversation around the table at lunch, we sort of got, uh, okay, is that actually possible? And we put together this big team that you see there, and everyone was working really hard um, to try and figure out if this was possible and to figure out all the scientific questions we could answer. And then, of course, you know, you always need a cake for the team. In this case, the cake, not a lie, uh, a cake exists. And so we made this enormous cake. And if, if you cut the cake in half, then you could see um, the interior layers of the cake. And uh, we actually put a giant lava tube in there as well. <laughs> oh, it's, so, it's an angel food cake, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think there's, it's a cheesecake, actually. Since oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next. Next. Um, so we had to go through a lot of processes in order to get this mission from the idea around the table to the point at which we we're actually going to propose it to NASA as a real mission. And so this included going out in the field. There's a picture of my dog who's actually sleeping right here in the room with me, <laughs> Juan Pablo. And then um, we had different tests. You know, suppose the lander landed at a crazy angle. Could our rover still get off at the top of the rover? So we built an entire lander in the Mars yard on JPL and we tried it out. And then I went to Japan, actually, to work with our Japanese colleagues, the same people who had discovered the pit and went to some Japanese lava tubes where you see me then. And then we had a little um, keychain size version of Axel because we had to actually explain it to everyone. A lot of parts of the, the mission is just, you know what you want to do and you know how you want to go about it, but you have to be able to put that in words to explain it to somebody else, which is where the writing and speaking comes in very handy. Um, next slide. And so the future of Moondiver, first I wanted to show you this picture because um, we were talking about how Moondiver would be controlled. And earlier everyone was talking about, oh, they're controlling the Curiosity rover from their homes and you know everyone has their cats walking across the keyboards and stuff. So they asked me like, oh, where, how would you set up the room that would control Moondiver? And so I made this picture with Photoshop and I said, I would like a control room that looks like this. 
because like you can make it in the cave and it can have this, you know, like control chair and you know, it, the mission's gonna be 14 days long, 24 seven control. So I said, obviously I will be sitting in the control chair. And by that time, hopefully they have the technology to make it so that I can stay up for 14 days straight. Actually, <laughs> So in reality, we'd have an enormous room with a bunch of different people, all with their different um, things that they have to take care of um, during the mission. I, I keep pitching this to JPL um, uh, the authorities though and we'll see if eventually I can win them over. Um, so the future of Moondiver, last I talked to you all last year, I just turned in the, you know, maybe 400 page proposal that we had to this NASA mission opportunity called Discovery. Uh, there are 19 other proposals that, and then it takes, it took until January for them to tell you what the result of this proposal was. So in January, everyone knows the date and time that they're going to call you and they call all the the heads of the mission in the morning, and then they make the announcement in the afternoon. And between when they tell you in the morning whether it gets selected in the afternoon, when they tell everyone what the answer is, you can't see anyone, and you're not allowed to tell anyone what happened. <laughs> so it's a surprise. And so it's really funny because, you know, so I get the call, I'm in my house, and um, he says, this is NASA headquarters. You know, I'm calling to tell you about your mission. And then uh, he's like, are you ready to hear the answer? <laughs> I was like, yeah, maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sitting down. And he's like, are you ready to hear the answer now? And he's like, Moondiver was not selected <laughs> for the next round. <laughs> and so, so I was like, oh, oh, thank you so much for, uh, it's so nice to talk to you. And uh, I appreciate uh, being able to participate you know it's like it's such a funny experience <laughs> so in your heart of hearts many of these missions they go through like many different rounds and some of the missions that were chosen were going through like third or fourth round of being chosen and i was honestly all the missions they chose i was so happy because they were great and most of them the people that are running them are my friends anyway um but so then i came back to my like oh no i'm not gonna send a rover to the moon right now and then i thought well that's remember laura that wasn't your goal the goal was to see how far perseverance could take you in getting a mission funded. <laughs> and so, um, so that's where I am now. Now, now I uh, said, okay, well, tell me every possible thing. We went to NASA headquarters right before the pandemic hit, and we sat down in a room with them, and we said, please tell us every single thing that you hated about this mission, everything. <laughs> if you didn't like it, if you didn't believe it, if you didn't think it was good, just let, let us know. And they sort of just told us, and I think, it was a very, a very important lesson of kind of trying to do something really big is just how good are you at taking criticism. And so I told my team, I was like, our, our goal here is to demonstrate how good our team is at taking criticism. And that's our only goal for this meeting. <laughs> Laura, so, uh, I'm going to have to interrupt you. Uh, we're, we're, we're running out of time, I'm afraid. Uh, we're a little bit over. So Okay, um, well, that's all I really had to say. Um, this is kind of um, the you. future of Moondivers out there, and hopefully I'll be talking to you again next year, and I'll, I'll have more to talk about then. <laughs> uh, as always, you know, we're, we've run out of time. I mean, we've got, what, over 100 years of combined experience on this panel alone, and there's not enough time to talk about it all. So I wanted to say, everybody who's watching, thank you so much. Uh, you can see that you know, we're all, all excited. We're, all, we're really you know, big, fat nerds, and um, uh, this is where it's at. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it, and we will see you next year, we hope, uh, at, uh, you know, at, at Comic-Con. Goodbye, all. Bye-bye, everyone. Hope to see you next year. <laughs>